Hello, everyone. This is Gloria Perez. I am president and CEO of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. And as we gather today, please join me in honoring the sacred lands on which we live, learn, and work. The lands we call Minnesota include the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of 11 sovereign nations. We pay homage to those who were here before us on this land, the seven Anishinaabe nations of the Chippewa and Ojibwa, and the four Dakota nations. Along with these 11 tribes, we honor all the indigenous people of this territory, many from tribes which were never formally recognized by the federal government. We take this moment to honor, respect those who were before us, among us, and those who are yet to come. Here I am. Okay. Just wanted to let you know I was having a little technical difficulty there. Um, so glad to have you all with us for this webinar on the status of women and girls in Minnesota. I am pleased to share this report with you today along with our lead researcher on this report and a longtime colleague active in policy and across sectors. I'll introduce my co-presenters in just a moment. I'm excited to hear insights on their report and what on this report and what it means to the lives of women and girls in our state. This report represents the leading research on the status of women and girls in Minnesota. We're holding space in our conversation today to address solutions, specifically those pathways we see to change our systems through policy. And at the back of our report, we'll link in the chat now, we've shared some recommendations for policies that are part of driving change in our systems, structures, and attitudes. At the Women's Foundation, we've been investing in research since our inception. And since 2009, we've been partnering with the Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy at the Humphrey School. To produce this report, which investigates how women and girls are faring in the areas of economics, safety, health, and leadership. This report is inclusive of gender expansive and trans women, representing the full experience of how we define women at the foundation. What we see in this report reflects the context we are living in. Two years into the pandemic and continuing to reckon with the racial injustice we see all around us. The research is really meant as a tool for action. So our legislators and decision makers across sectors can use their influence to address inequities in their fields. It's a tool for our community partners to target their work and strengthen their case for funding. And it shows us that we have to change systems if we are to realize a world and a state where all women and girls thrive. We have to reimagine the way we think about this data. Instead of placing the burden of fixing disparities on women and communities most impacted, I think it's time we think about the ways our systems don't support or protect women and communities. And yet women are working overtime to hold up a world that is not created to honor and compensate our care and experiences. We're interested from hearing you too, from, from you also. To facilitate this presentation, the chat will be disabled, but I invite you to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And you can submit questions at any time and we'll preserve time at the end of the presentation to try to answer your questions. So I want to welcome and thank Dr. Christina Ewig and Shantara Hardy for joining us today. Our intention is to unpack the way in which we think about disparities that are faced by so many women across our systems. We want to ask who bears the responsibility for addressing these disparities and how can we rethink the responsibilities of our government and our employers? Today, we're also going to take a special look at the recommendations that have just come out of Attorney General Ellison's task force on expanding the economic security of women. Now, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Christina Ewig, the lead researcher on this report and faculty director on the Center for Women, Gender, and Public Policy at the University of Minnesota. And we are grateful that you are here to help us break down some of the data, Christina, and some of the context for which we've been seeing through um, the pandemic. And we're, you've taken a front row seat at the economic policy table uh, with the Attorney General's Task Force on Women's Economic Security. And so I'm so pleased that you're going to bring those insights today. And I'm thrilled that we are joined by Shantara Hardy, 
an award-winning public policy professional and serial entrepreneur with over 15 years of experience leading work in areas of government affairs, healthcare access, economic and workforce development, environmental sustainability, city planning, and international affairs. Ontario, we're excited to hear your perspective on how we might reimagine our systems as vehicles for change, driving policies that center uh, equity and justice in our work. So as we've seen over the past two years of pandemic and as the global uprisings for racial justice have illuminated, the crises we face show us the truth of our inequities at the root of our systems. We have tremendous opportunity in this moment to rethink how uh, we work and how we put women at the center of our solutions. As a statewide community foundation, we work with and for communities to address the greatest challenges facing women and girls in our state, grant making, research, and public policy. Now, I know you're both invested in a world where women and girls thrive. So Shantar and Christina, could you tell us a little about what brings you to this work? Let's start with you, Shantara. Gloria, thank you so much for um, just the work that you are leading and the commitment to ensuring that women and girls are seen, are heard, and are invested in. And so I'm very excited to have this conversation. I will say that what brings me um, to this work is, is a relentless and unapologetic commitment to economic prosperity for women and girls. You know, we had an amazing opening track talking about our Wonder Women. And for me, that thriving including them to includes them to prosper, dance, and as my good friend Akua is teaching me to rest because we hold so much in our lanes of responsibility. And so for me, it is that lane of economic prosperity as we look to dismantle disparities, as we look to uh, specifically uh, tear down those generational poverty areas that show up, especially for, for women of color. And so I'm really excited to, to have this conversation and I um, really hope that those that are on the line take this data to heart and then to action because we've been seeing it happen so much and in so many parts of our communities. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Ewick? Sure, it's great to be here, Gloria, and to talk with everybody um, who's listening in today. So as the director of the Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy, it's part of our mission to provide students and policymakers and the broader public with the tools to better understand how public policies impact gender inequality in our communities, um, whether that be here in the Twin Cities, in the broader state, or in the nation and the world. And one of the ways we do that is through research. Um, as those of you who are familiar with the Humphrey School, you know that part of our ethos of the Humphrey School is community engagement. So the research that we do at the Center on Minnesota is part of our contribution um, to the community, our commitment to a better understanding the realities of the members um, in Minnesota. And that means understanding how inequality may play out differently for different members of our community, whether it's uh, looking carefully at race or ethnic differentiations or disability um, and how these interact with gender. So for example, you'll see in this report that we like to break down even broader categories like African-American into larger immigrant groups, um, as well as blacks that have been here um, since the days of slavery. So some statistics in this, this report will be dispiriting, um, but we hope that by identifying disparities across many different lines and intersecting lines of difference is a first step towards supporting collective action to address these disparities. And Gloria, you mentioned the Attorney General's Task Force. That was one important venue where the center could come in and bring this kind of research um, that we do in the status report and other reports that the center does into conversation with representatives across the state who are also interested in addressing and finding solutions to these intersectional economic disparities um, that that task force was focused on. And so that also fits well with our theme today, which is how do we change the broader policy conversation that is for too long focused on individual solutions 
and think, take a step back and think about what we can do as a community, what we can do in terms of collective responsibility for addressing these disparities that we know exist. Thank you. Thank you both for the passion you bring to this, to this conversation. Well, let's get started by looking at our intersectional equity framework. At Women's Foundation, we know that women and girls' experiences with education, healthcare, employment, and wages are impacted by gender, race, place in the state, or additional identities. And when we disaggregate data, as is done in this report, we see how multiple identities held by women and girls have lifelong consequences that impact her health, safety, and economic security. Our identities impact our access to opportunity, well-being, uh, equity, and our identities impact how we experience systems. I'm thinking about housing, education, healthcare, applying for a loan, accessing employment opportunities. All this access depends on who you are and the identities that you hold, including where you live, your race, ethnicity, immigration status, age, and whether you have a disability. We use this analysis to guide our investments in all areas, including policy and grant making, because we know that the more we value and invest in community-centered solutions, the power that lives within our states, communities, the stronger and more lasting our solutions will be. Shantara, what comes to mind for you when thinking about the importance of both aggregating data and then thinking about intersectionality in policy solutions? You know, we, we've learned during this pandemic that what you inspect is what you improve. Mm -hmm. And this pandemic has showed us that we haven't been inspecting a lot within our systems. And so those that um, have either been on the sidelines or in the cracks, forever we didn't see them. And now when the system has dismantled itself, we're seeing all of those issues be compounded. And so when you think about um, being able to unpack the dimensions of diversity that are throughout this report, you're able to go in and improve in a way that you're meeting people where they are with their needs. And you are doing it in a way that you're responding with very specific and in particular, culturally competent solutions that will actually be sustainable. And that's, that's, that's something that is, is pretty powerful. And what's crazy about this and what excites me about this report that is kind of new in Minnesota. There's been a number of groups in the policy space with the Coalition for a uh, Asian American Leaders and um, a number of different organizations that for years have been fighting to get data disaggregated. And so I'm excited that we will get into a situation where we not only, um, you know, normalize disaggregating data to solve solutions, that it actually becomes a part of our framework to get to solutions that actually drive change within systems. And so I'm really excited about this. I'm really hopeful that when it comes to our policymakers at all levels of government, that they take this framework and drive solutions from a policy perspective, but also from a funding perspective to be able to get to, um, you know, just a much more sustainable um, approach and a much more sustainable um, commitment to women and girls. And yeah. so this, this framework is pretty powerful and I think can lead to that type of environment to drive policy. Yeah, thank you. And I love that. What you inspect is what you improve. That's absolutely right. Well, let's take a first look at uh, the first area of research. So economic. Now the report will show that um, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed and exacerbated many of the underlying factors that prevent women in Minnesota and the nation from achieving economic security. We know that women's economic security intersects with every other issue in a woman's life. It impacts her health, safety, and her access to leadership opportunities. 
We see in this report that Minnesota continues to be a national leader in women's workforce participation. And women in the state earn a majority of all post-secondary degrees. But yet these achievements don't translate into economic security. I think that's really important data. Um, the research shows that economic security and a person's ability to prosper and build wealth is made up of many building blocks. Through two years of the pandemic, we have seen women pushed out of the workforce in record numbers with lasting impacts. And if you remember, 100% of unemployment numbers were women in the, the December 2020 report. So many areas where we made strides. This actually happened as they shouldered more of the childcare and caregiving responsibilities. But we've also seen more vulnerability because of the fields in which women are working in. And so, um, Christina, I know you've been studying these effects since the beginning, but Shantara, your work has taken you also into nearly every sector we're going to be addressing. So I want to invite you to comment on different data, data points on mobility because of the feedback as we go through the slides. Sorry about that feedback. And so, um, Christina, I know you I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, well, we're just gonna proceed and go to the first slide on the wealth gap. Okay, good. Um, so overall, uh, wealth has been generally stable for white communities over generations across our state, but the same can't be said for communities of color. So what this means is that our systemic causes are at work in the lack of intergenerational mobility. Wealth provides advantages like educational opportunities, home ownership in safe neighborhoods, and a financial safety net. Education and home ownership are just a couple of indicators of economic security. But we see in this newest report that education is no longer seen as an element in what keeps women and women of color, especially, from building wealth. Christina, what does the research and the times we're living in say about what's most essential for creating wealth and sustainability for women? Yeah, we have had some changes in this uh, year's report compared to our report two years ago in that, um, because the economics research has changed. So we went back as we were preparing this report to review what the latest research on the wealth gap was telling us. Um, and economists who had traditionally included education as one of the big factors um, leading to contributing to the wealth gap are finding that it's not a major factor in it. And that's because what it's, it relates to something that we've actually seen in our report over time, that in spite of education, we continue to see both gender and race uh, gaps in terms of the wealth gap. Um, we've shown for a long time in this report that in spite of equal education, there continues to be a wage gap. And that's one of the drivers uh, in terms of the wealth gap for women. And new research uh, on African-Americans specifically shows that when comparing households with similar education levels, uh, African-American households continue to lack the wealth that white households have. So education um, has been eliminated um, from the broader thinking about what leads to, leads to wealth gaps. When we look at Minnesota, the wealth gap is massive. The median net worth of black households in Minnesota is zero. And that's compared to 211,000 uh, median net worth for white households and $18,000, not not too big there either, but $18,000 for Latina, Latino households. So uh, really important wealth gaps in our state. Home ownership is the biggest and most important building block for wealth, especially for African-American families. And we know that we have deep histories of redlining um, discrimination in relationship to home ownership in this state. And as I said, for the gender wealth gap, it really is the wage gap that is the big contributing factor. Yeah, thank you. Montero, what do you think about building wealth and passing on wealth? And what are the greatest opportunities that you see? Um, you know, do you see solutions that the policy, that policy can address? Absolutely. I, you know, the very fact 
that the medium net worth of black households is zero is is alarming. And that is something that um, should not be taken lightly as we look, especially here in Minnesota at a almost $9.6 billion surplus. As we look at the opportunity to um, truly lean into what you said earlier around security. And that's something that is not happening in many of the households that um, Dr. Yu just laid out with respect to um, the different gaps. And so the first thing is pay women. Why are we still celebrating Equal Pay Day? <laughs> pay women. Make sure that worth is paid for. Making sure that we have wages that align with equitable practices. Making sure that in that security that we are investing in access to capital so that folks can be able to get household ownership as a part of their portfolio and access to investment. You know, one of the things that is often the go-to here in Minnesota is the social service first. There needs to be parity around the true economic investment in households and making sure that the playing field is level in all opportunities related to capital access. That's important. And lastly, and I'll talk a little bit more about it um, as we get you know, further into the economics, is if we're truly going to dismantle um, disparities related to economics, we have to make sure that entrepreneurship and business development is a part of that equation. And, and that piece is, is, is so important to ensuring that we're able to sustain our households. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, that stat that you mentioned, the last thing I'll say, that in December, mm -hmm. that women were 100%, 100%. I think I saw a stat that that, that December number, when it all was said and done, probably put us back five to seven years with respect to women in the C-suite. As many of those women, it wasn't by choice. Many was by childcare that they had to leave their um, roles. And so we are going backwards and we need to figure out how we quickly, we were already behind the eight ball in so many different areas. And now we have to pick up steam and passing policies to ensure that that security is truly wrapped around women and girls so that we can make up ground to get folks back into leadership, being able to prosper because it's so important for our overall economy. Thank you both, that's just terrific. You're absolutely right. Um, it's a nice segue actually into our next slide regarding the wage gap. And um, here we see that it hasn't narrowed in five years. And so nationally, to your point about Equal Pay Day, which was just this um, week on March 15th, we recognized how far women on average must work into the next year to earn what a white man earned the previous year. And at the Women's Foundation, we also recognize Equal Pay Day for each of our communities as a day in which these women catch up with the salaries of an average white man. So for instance, Latina Equal Pay Day isn't until December 8th, to your point. It's just not something to celebrate. Uh, we argue that we need to center the earnings of those who make the least on this chart. Latinas who earn 55 cents on the dollar, Black and Native American women don't earn much more at 61 cents on the dollar. Unfortunately, the gender wage gap hasn't changed much in recent years, and we can see that men's wages in many of these communities are also not much better. What are your thoughts, uh, Christina? Yeah, uh, the overall 79 cents on the dollar has not changed since our last report. So not a lot of movement. Um, there is a little bit of movement 
within, you know, change within these subgroups, uh, but you can still see some really important disparities. Um, this is a place where I can stop and talk a little bit about how we work with the data and disaggregate even further. Um, if, for example, we break down the category of Black further, we find that Somali women earn just 47 cents compared to the median wage of a white man. So that means they've got to work more than twice the amount of time or two years to earn what the average white man will earn in, uh, in one year. Put this all together, on average, women in Minnesota lose an estimated $447,960 in lifetime earnings just due to the gender wage gap. And of course, that's the average. So when you look at women of color and Native American women, it's going to be much greater losses over their lifetime. And as I stated before, uh, this does not hinge on education. Regardless of education, women's earnings trail those of similarly educated men. Um, and it's going to widen over the course of a lifetime. And we'll talk a bit more about that later in the presentation. Thank you, Christina. So the first piece of this puzzle is to understand the wage, to understanding the wage gap is occupational clustering. Isn't that right, Christina? I think we've got a slide on. Yeah, so occupational clustering results in lower wages for women in Minnesota. Here on this graphic, you can see how professions like healthcare practitioners, those in personal care services, think about your hairstylist that you may go to, healthcare support, women who are working um, with our elderly in long-term healthcare. They're earning on average about $18 an hour compared to male-dominated fields like construction or the military, where we're talking about $21 an hour. You can also see in more professional areas a gap between those in the sciences and those in the more human-centered um, professions. Uh, so occupational clustering, we estimate, or economists estimate, accounts for about 50% of that wage gap. Uh, women of color and Native American women tend to be concentrated in these lower wage parts of the more feminine occupations. Uh, many of which are service occupations that don't provide uh, full benefits, and benefits are either slim or scarce. For white women, it's about one in five that are in the service sector. And I think a really important factor here is that women are also concentrated in minimum wage jobs. Our latest calculations in this report is that in Minnesota, 59% of those workers that are working at minimum wage or below are women. I think it's also important to step back and say, well, why is it this the case that we see uh, lower wages for certain kinds of work? It's really what the value that we are placing on this kind of work. It doesn't mean that it takes less education to work in healthcare support than it does in construction. It doesn't mean that there's less skill involved. And in fact, we can see injury rates for a individual working in a nursing home that out exceed those of, for example, men working in construction. So it's not about risk. It's about the value that we are placing on different kinds of work. Policy is a good tool um, for making some systemic changes uh, to address this gap, especially the wage gap, but also the occupational um, segregation. In the Attorney General's Task Force, for example, we have some really specific uh, recommendations that came out of that group. One was to raise the minimum wage to $17.40 an hour. And given that large number of women in minim minimum wage jobs, that would be a really important way of starting to reduce that wage gap. Another is to consider what we call comparable worth laws. We have that law in the public sector in Minnesota. And what it does is it encourages employers to look at the different aspects of a job and reconsider the value of that job. So that is one way, if extended to the private sector, we could encourage employers to um, stop the practice of systemic, systematically paying feminine jobs less. A third recommendation that comes out of the Attorney General's report is to combat gender discrimination in wages, because discrimination, we know, accounts for between 5 to 10 percent of this gap. Um, but there are tools that we can use, things like sal greater salary transparency um, and bans on asking 
individuals what their salary history has been. So you don't see a perpetuation of low wages. And transparency can put a little bit of pressure on employers who may not be um, comfortable showing the disparities of the salaries that they are paying and also give individuals the tools to know where they stand in relationship to their peers in the workplace. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's really important. One of the things that the Women's Foundation is doing to address women's low representation in high wage fields like construction and engineering is that we're investing in programs like uh, the one through M State program in Moorhead and another that supports high school programs on the Iron Range with education and non-traditional fields for women, along with economic and leadership growth opportunities to give them the confidence they need to build their own power and agency. Now, Shantara, I know as an entrepreneur yourself, you have other ideas that you wanna lift up here in terms of pathways. Yes, and I really um, like the clarity with respect to those recommendations regarding getting to that wage gap, the career pathways that so many amazing organizations around the state have been investing in are putting um, women on a path to be able to bust through those industries that, you know, are not seeing high numbers of women in leadership. And so the opportunity to be able to um, make a difference there is pretty critical. For, for me, you know, I, I get to wake up every day as a, as a serial entrepreneur, my company, um, Civic Eagle, in the public policy space, building um, legislative intelligence tools to help folks be able to track policy like the ones that we're talking about across the country and um, at the federal level. And what I've seen in that, company being in that space, just like in the um, workforce space, you know, women are dominating, as you said, this low wage work with low wage benefits. What we're seeing in the entrepreneurial space is women dominating high, at a high rate, starting businesses in industries that are not growing, not in the growth industries, not in those industries that are um, really you know, focused on high earning potential as builders, as innovators. And so that entrepreneurship is the other side of the coin for wealth building. You know, how do we make sure that in addition to doing amazing work on the front lines, women are a climate, that we're building the next, you know, business that is going to change the um, trajectory of greenhouse gases, that we are the ones, you know, making sure that bias is not an algorithm as, as we build technology um, for facial recognition and other high growth industry areas, that for healthcare, that we are the ones building the med tech companies. And if we are not making sure that on the flip side of the career pathways that we're building, you know, entrepreneurship pathways that are channeling folks into those growth industries, then we're just going to keep repeating the cycle on the other end. You know, one of the most powerful opportunities in this space is that, you know, women in particular, Black women are the largest cohort, followed by Lat Latino women starting businesses. Mm -hmm. And what we know about them is they hire folks into their community. What we also know about them is that they're committed oftentimes to living wage and family sustaining wages. And so making sure that both sides of those coins is, is that full circle around building wealth and allowing for the growth in our ecosystem to not be siloed and making sure we're investing in a way that um, we're actually leading the way. You know, that, that's $440,000 for a wage gap, that's a, I can buy a lot of shoes with that for That's right. Absolutely. I can, I can donate to some amazing causes and, and drive some amazing things in our economy. And so that entrepreneurship piece is, is pretty critical to make sure that we're able to um, build a stronger economy and women be at the forefront of leading in those areas that domination will continue to be in the low wage, in the low growth space, if we don't shift that mindset to be focused on growth, to be focused on innovation, 
and to be focused on leading alongside of women and girls that are taking our social issues and being unafraid, how do we make sure we're pushing to make sure that they are the ones at the head of the, at the, of the boardroom making decisions on where to invest? So that's important as we shift our mindset into wealth building for workers, wealth building for owners. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for your perspectives. Um, Dr. Ewig, let's talk a little bit about the cost of childcare in this equation. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, uh, and so now I can speak directly to those uh, as well as we, as we go through some of these statistics. Um, so care responsibilities impact income over the long term. When I said we would return to that long term wage gap, uh, that wage gap is even bigger than that $400,000 when we consider the fact that women often take time out of the workforce um, for periods of time to take care of children, um, disabled individuals, elders. Um, they may work part time or fewer hours. And all of this then leads to even larger wage gaps over the long term. When it comes to childcare specifically, I mean, this is something that can help women maintain a more steady uh, workforce participation by have, knowing that their kids can be cared for by someone else uh, in a high quality childcare setting. The federal government recommends that families only spend, wait for it, 7% of their income on childcare. But what you see here in these statistics is that the cost of center-based childcare, and this is for infants, that's our most expensive um, form of childcare, would be equivalent to 132% of the median income for a native of the average Native American woman, for example. So childcare is exceedingly expensive. Um, in our state, we're one of the most expensive places for childcare, yet it's critical to women's employment. And this is an, a, a point in which we can answer one of the questions in the chat um, about the wages of childcare providers. Uh, the median hourly wage for childcare providers in Minnesota is just $13.57 an hour. So this critical care um, that's important for working women is often provided by working women but whom are working at some of the lowest wages that, um, that we have uh, uh, in the state. So that's another question of the value that we are placing on particular kinds of work. There's also a question in the chat about the large number of women who have left or lost jobs during the pandemic and, and, ha and had a spouse who could afford to stay, uh, so therefore they could afford to stay home. And we saw this happen, so for those women, who had a partner who was working um, that could support the family, uh, we saw many women with children, especially young children, leave the workforce. The Minnesota Fed has important research that we cite in this report that shows an exodus of women, especially women with children under five, out of the workforce because it was simply too hard um, to handle the stresses of the pandemic along with childcare and work. But of course, only some women can do that. So these figures you have here on the slide are for single, single mothers who do not have that option of simply leaving the workforce. Um, but this is a question uh, and we've seen um, some recovery, but not a, not a huge, it's been a very slow recovery of those women uh, returning the workforce to the workforce as a result of the pandemic to answer the, the question um, that was posed in the Q&A. Thanks for responding to that in your in your comments. Um, you know, at uh, the Women's Foundation, our policy agenda calls for paid family and medical leave to be a benefit that should not be a privilege, but a fundamental right for all workers. And, and we hope that business owners can stand on the right side of supporting workers for their long-term benefit. Um, Shantara, what are you seeing in this area? How can we invest in women more comprehensively in the workforce? You know, I really appreciate that language around reimagining because when you raise your hand to do that, that means that you're tapping in the courage. And many of our employers, the time now is to have courage because the burden of in this um, data set around childcare should not be on the mother. 
and it should not be on the worker. We have to make sure that we have a balance of shifting to that employer responsibility. We have to make sure that we are thinking, meeting this moment for what it is. And so when we reimagine, you can't make decisions around hybrid work and re remote work and not be mindful that there are more than three children in the household. And so if I am in one of those positions where I have to either be working with customers on the outside and I have children in the household, how am I going to give five-star service? And if you're not thinking comprehensively as an employer, because you can't cut and paste what you did in person into the Zoom room, it just mm -hmm. doesn't work. Culture mm -hmm. is not created by cutting and pasting. Mm -hmm. You have to be committed to, to leaning into um, creating new cultures and new investments. And it's not something that's new. Employers used to have childcare on site. Employers used to invest in that as a benefit and as an incentive, come work for me. If that is, if we don't make sure that we're like shifting that and being open to investing in the brick and mortar, being open to investing their power to go up to the legislature and say enough is enough because $13 is putting some really low value in this space, yeah. just like in senior care. And so how do we make sure that we are investing in facilities, that we're investing in programs that are positioning um, women to own their own childcare. There's a great one at, I think it's the YWC in Minneapolis. Like, how are we making sure that we are doing that? And then lastly, I'll just say, you know, when it comes to this childcare piece, when it comes to this, this moment that we're in, there is this importance to invest in the whole human of the woman from a wellness perspective. And I know we're gonna talk about safety and other areas, but being able to be well in business, being able to be able to show up with less stressors in the workplace, it matters. And if I have to worry about if my child is gonna be safe, if my child is gonna be taking care of the whole day if I can't afford, them going to a childcare facility, it's not a space of wellness. And so okay. that the, the courage that's needed for that reimagination around this childcare space is now. We're here now. It's not later. It's now. And so I, I'm, I'm excited about programs that are out there. In my former role as commissioner at DEED, that was one of the uh, things that I got to quickly um understand when I was wondering why is Dee doing child care and it was because this shift needed to happen and so we have to keep making sure that the burden is shifted and aligned in order to pay for um, child care because we need it. Thank you. You know this conversation about economics um, just really points to the fact that the research is also interconnected right uh, we're gonna, we are going to go on to talk about other aspects of uh, health and safety. And I'll just say that the Women's Foundation was instrumental in passing the 2014 Women's Economic Security uh, Act, which expanded economic opportunity and strengthened workplace protections for women. And so now as we advocate for stronger economic protections that benefit all women and increased opportunities for funding uh, for young women of color and entrepreneurs, we are supporting recommendations of Attorney General Keith Ellison's task force to address uh, economic security. So um, in the interest of time, because we have these other sections that we talked about, um, let's go on to the section about safety. Again, um, so much more that could be said in this particular area. Um, overall, I want to just say that violence is a reality for too many women across the state of Minnesota. And we know that women and girls are harmed by gender-based violence across their lifetimes in homes, on the streets, in public institutions like schools and workplace, and in the criminal justice system. One in two Minnesota women report sexual violence, and one in four report physical violence from a partner in her lifetime. That is profound. 
Consequences of this violence ripple over a lifetime and affect all measures of health and well being, from physical and mental health to in pregnancy, housing security, economic productivity, and personal security. As a longtime investor in safety and ending sex trafficking, we've been partnering with groups like The Link, who have led demonstrating how basic needs of shelter impact safety for young people and all people. So like economic safety has its own share of building blocks that include safe housing and vulnerability to violence. So on this next slide, um, I would love to just talk a little bit about, or have you, Christina, point out a little bit about what we're seeing here. Sure. Um, so here in, in this slide, we're seeing uh, violence over the course of women and girls' lifetimes, um, separating it out between sexual violence and physical violence. Um, and I think the key takeaway here is that no matter where women and girls are in their life cycle, they are potentially um, can be uh, victims of violence. Uh, we know that many go on to live um, fulfilling lives, but this can also have long-term impacts in terms of the trauma and stress that it creates. Um, I can also talk here a little bit about the impacts of violence that we saw during COVID. Yes. Uh, and COVID led to some exacerbation um, of violence in a number of different ways from what we, we might consider to be um, more dangerous violence to more everyday kind of violence. For example, harassment of women and girls. We saw an increase of harassment of women, women and girls during the pandemic. Uh, we saw in particular increase in harassment of Asian American and Pacific Islander women because of the stereotypes that were being used in relationship to the pandemic uh, and where it came from. Um, tipped service workers because of all the questions of masking and being indoors and outdoors and so on, tipped service workers experienced a dramatic increase in sexual harassment during COVID-19. Uh, and when we had those stay at home orders, um, that was a particularly dangerous time for many women. And we saw that the stress was likely the stress being caused um, by the pandemic, but then the inability to, to as easily leave one's home and go to public spaces like libraries, for example, um, that led to spikes in domestic violence. So uh, this is one of the areas also where the Attorney General's task force report, even though we were focused on economic questions, we also addressed and understood that all of these things are linked, right? So for example, if a woman does not have economic security, it can be make it that much more difficult to leave a violent relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to show and understand how safety and economics and other parts that we will talk about later, such as health, and leadership, they're all interlinked. Thank you for that. Um, let's go on to the next slide and really want to talk about the vulnerability and violence our young people face caused in part by the reality of pervasive structural racism and harmful bias has consequences. This report looks at how women and girls are impacted by state structural violence, including school discipline and incarceration. Uh, Christina, can you share more about what this statistic uh, is talking about and what the research shows regarding women and girls of color being treated differently in school, uh, on police stops and being overrepresented in our carceral system. Yeah, each, each uh, edition of, of this report, we've been trying to expand the data that we have um, related to our carceral system in the United States. Uh, and we know that um, these relationships begin at a young age and they often begin in the schools. So this statistic shows that in Minnesota, black girls are 10 times more likely than white girls to be suspended. Um, this is from the National Women's Law Center. Uh, when we broke down the Minnesota student survey for the report, we also found that girls of color and LGBTQ students were sent out of the classroom more often and that black and Latina girls felt uncomfortable with police presence in their schools. Um, 
in to speak to the suspension um, piece here, uh, I think Chantera could give us um, greater uh, perspective on why we see this uh, happening at a young age and why we see greater likelihood of suspensions. We know that it outpaces proportion of students of color. So for example, in June of 2021, the St. Paul Public Schools, a committee of the, the, those schools recommended bringing an end to suspensions because while black students make up 25% of all students, the district's population um, they make, in the district, uh, they make up 75% of all suspensions. And this has to do with stereotypes and what we call um, adultification. That is where uh, adults view children as more, as, as older than their age and more mature than they actually are. And this often happens, especially with black girls in our schools. And that's why we see um, these rates being, being higher for this group than for other groups. The important part is that while this begins in the schools, it then leads to patterns that we also see in our criminal justice system, as Gloria mentioned. So for example, when we look at Minneapolis police stops, police stops of women of color um, are higher than that of white women. Native American women, for example, represent 6% of Minneapolis police stops, while they're only 1% of the Minneapolis population. Uh, Shantara, do you have perspectives and that you could share on why we see these kinds of patterns? Yes, and I think you you summed it up very well with the adultification. When you look at the bias and perception um, in this slide related to Black girls and other um, girls of color, they are perceived as being older. And they are also, you know, oftentimes in situations where violence shows up, they're bringing with them that lived and learned experience at home that is, is, is the trauma and other things that are happening. And so that totality um, is, is leading to a lot of this and the structural racism that exists in our school systems related to how we see our young people is also um, taking that to the next level. And so you know, making sure that from a policy perspective, we're investing in programs that are strengthening the self-esteem self and educating um, uh, adults on how to see young people. There are a number of amazing programs with, you know, Girls Are Powerful, Loving the Skin I'm In, and, and Girls Inc. and a number of organizations that are out there on the front lines to ensure that they can break through those barriers that um, you know, provide that bias. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, I'd like to have us go to the next slide because uh, what we're seeing in this environment is that the rights of trans people and their families threatened around the country. Um, the report is showing us how LGBTQ plus people face added risks for their health and safety, including housing, harassment, and fear of reporting violence. Um, as we see with Black girls on the previous slide, hostile environments for living as yourself have consequences for safety, health, and income. What would you add here, Dr. Ewig? Oops, you're on mute. I would add that um, simply, simply that this is disproportionate, the number of LGBTQ plus youth, um, youth that are under 25 among our homeless population compared to their, their proportion of our population. Uh, and it's a reflection of the discrimination um, and rejection oftentimes that they're feeling in their homes and in their communities that leads them into, into homelessness. Um, we can see this in other gradations and some of the other uh, research that we have in terms of the violence that they um, are subject to within homes and also harassment. Uh, we have figures in the report in terms of harassment of lesbian students, for, for example, and transgender students that, are hara that report harassment in the schools by their peers. Thank you. And we can see that environments around our children clearly matter, how they are perceived based on their identities. You know, if young people are facing harm or not being valued for who they are, their vulnerability introduces the opportunity for a whole host of risks their health and well-being, and ultimately their economic potential. So um, thank you for your comments. 
On our next slide, I want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that we've been continuing to track violence in Native communities. Um, and, you know, they are facing gender based violence and suicide risk. Um, Dr. Ewig, say more about this. Sure. Um, so in Minnesota, Native women are murdered at a rate seven times that of white women, and Black women are murdered at a rate 2.7 times higher than white women. That's, of course, um, in the case of Native American women, endemic to the problem of missing and murder, uh, Indigenous women and girls, um, where uh, the Sovereign Bodies Institute, whose research we also have in the report, finds that there are 147 cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Minnesota since 1919, but 86% of those cases occurred in the year 2000 or later. We also have figures in the report related to the extremely high suicide rate by young Native girls in our community. More than 25% of Native 9th, 10th, and 11th graders have attempted suicide, which is way above any other ethnic group or racial group in our state. Um, so these are areas of um, very high concern um, that would really should raise alarm bells for us. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, the first step is to really shed light on this problem, to bring the reality out of the shadows. And we are very grateful for the visibility Native communities in our state have brought to making this horrific violence visible and tackle the issue. And this is not just an Indigenous issue, this is an issue for all of us. And we've been working through our policy work to support the creation of Native-led Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office, and then now working on the creation of a Missing and Murdered African American Women's Task Force, um, and investing in those recommendations. So um, really important that we continue to think about um, how we you know, shed the light on this. Um, okay, I realize that we're probably running out of time, um, but I just wanna say that to increase safety, um, we really just need to continue to have this conversation and recognize the intersectionality um, that exists within all the work that we're doing here and how these issues are interconnected. I wanna quickly move on to health. We know that the pandemic uh, revealed health disparities and differences in access and treatment that have long existed. And through the research and our listening sessions, we saw that mental health is physical health. And the effects of systemic racism and, vi and violence, as I said, are interconnected. And particularly in COVID, you know, while we saw improvements around access to services, um, including virtual visits, the data showed that people's access to care has actually been diminished. And so, Dr. Ewig, you want to say a little something about this? Oops, you're on mute. Sure, let me do so pretty quickly since we're, we're, low, we're low on time. And I'll say three things. Okay. One, we know that um, more individuals from communities of color died as a result of COVID. And that's because of underlying conditions that are often caused by stress, long-term stress um, and other fat, trauma, that poverty, all of which lead to uh, lower health as well as um, Gap, significant gaps in access to healthcare. So we know direct impacts of COVID in that way. We also know in terms of mental health that we saw women um, in particular and Latinos um, especially having much higher rates of depression and anxiety as a result of the pandemic. And third, if we even go to the next slide, um, we know that cost is a barrier. So when it comes to access to healthcare services to deal with those mental health issues or those underlying conditions, all of which were exacerbated by COVID. We know that women of color in particular, here you have the statistics, one in five black women and one in three Latina women here in the state reported they could not see a doctor because of costs in the past year. So um, a combination of factors that limit our access to healthcare um, here and especially for communities of color. Thank you for, for being brief on, on those points. And I know we're up against time. So let me just say there's so much more in this report. It has been linked into the chat for you to continue to go through. Um, I wanna just quickly thank you, Dr. Ewig and Shantara for being part of this conversation. We could have spent so much more time um, on this. And uh, for those who have questions, we will certainly follow up. 
But as we often say, nothing happens without leadership. And you'll see all that data that that is a place that gives us hope. And um, we need to not only get people into leadership, but we need to support them and think about how we continue to think about leaders as holistic uh, individuals who need those supports and um, not leave them uh, without a community that is going to continue to show up for them. So with that, thank you for showing up for the Women's Foundation. Thank you all for listening. And we will continue to be in conversation with you. All right, everybody, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.